Jiva Korja, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, or if you're watching a recording of this chat, welcome to another fireside chat. And this is our 87th one. And as has become customary, I will start with a prayer for peace. Gamara Shiakon or Fudnakrinya. Gamara Shiakon in our Jaili Agus in our Jira. Gunairi Lin Lenar Garmaka. Gangwich Buikus Jeev. Je Quivdika, Espirit Quivdika. May peace prevail on earth. May peace prevail in our homes and in our countries. May our missions be accomplished. We thank you, guardian spirits and guardian deities. As the fever of day calms towards twilight, may all that is strained in us come to ease. We pray for all who suffered violence today. May an unexpected serenity surprise them. For those who risk their lives each day for peace, may their hearts glimpse providence at the heart of history. As those who make riches from violence and war might hear in their dreams the cries of the lost. That we might see through our fear of each other a new vision to heal our fatal attraction to aggression. That those who enjoy the privilege of peace might not forget their tormented brothers and sisters. That the wolf might lie down with the lamb, that our swords be beaten into plowshares and no hurt or harm be done anywhere along the holy mountain. With thanks to John O'Donoghue. So it's lovely to be here again. Uh, I see Ferdiad, welcome back. Um, it's feeling autumnal right here as well. And uh, yeah, it's been raining. I suppose much welcome rain after this drought Although in Ireland, it's a drought after two weeks. But it's just so lovely to, funny to be, strange to be back here and it's great. Uh, so we've got people from Edinburgh, uh, California, Hot Barkley, uh, New York. Uh, and then greetings and blessings from Bavaria, my dearest Pendragon, and my condolences to the UK. Uh, I'm just thinking, uh, on this sad day, prayers and safe journey to Queen Elizabeth II. That's right, I just heard that she has passed. So uh, somebody else mentions a uh, Julia uh, from a rather sad London. Uh, hello, Franklin from the Netherlands, New York, San Jose, uh, Northamptonshire. Hi, Sue, another sad day. Yes, um, Sean from Longford, uh, Oklahoma, uh, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Arden Merkin, hi, John and Lynn. Uh, Jamie from Ohio, Abruzzo, Ciao, Beth, Pittsburgh. Uh, Yes, somebody says the whole world has changed. That's Jamie Hume. And somebody from Brazil, Cardiff. Uh, anyway, you're all very, very welcome. I suppose there's lots of emotions now with with this, uh, with, with the announcement of the passing of, the, of Queen Elizabeth. Um, anyway, just, just to acknowledge that. And uh, like I say, it's lovely to be back. I've had a great summer. Uh, I've come back rested and um, ready to head into the autumn now. So... We go to the UK actually this evening and I'm going to introduce, we're going to Darlington in the northeast of England and I'd like you to meet Jenny Uzel. Jenny, you are so, so welcome. Thank you. So you are in Darlington, so, and it's the northeast and uh, just tell us about Darlington. Okay, um, Darlington is a, it's a market town uh, serves the um, the dales and the hills around here. Um, so it's quite rural. There's a lot of, of mm. farmland around us. And we have um, quite a few interesting sites um, close by that would, would probably be um, be very, very famous if they were in the south. But because <laughs> they were north, nobody's heard of them. Uh, but they're they're well worth knowing about. We're about I would say six or seven miles here from Stanick Fort, which is I think actually the largest Iron Age fort in Europe. Oh, uh, certainly one of the largest, and um, is very close to Scotch Corner, which was a major Roman site. We were they were working gold, silver, and copper around here, so it was actually a very um, a very wealthy, very significant era in the Iron Age. And Stanick quite probably was the seat of Queen Kathmandua, oh, who is, okay. <laughs> is quite well known. So she she is um she is a local figure and um 
we've we've very recently set up a, a new seed group in Darlington and Stanick Fort is very much our, our inspiration for that. So the, the group is called um, Mandua Brigger. Um, and the, the Mandua is from the name of Carter Mandua because that means, we think that means, my, I, my, my friend Liz, who is probably listening tonight, who has done huge amounts of research about this, thinks that the name means the mayor who carries or the mayor who takes. And we think that there is absolutely no hard evidence for this, but it, it, it works as well as any other theory. And it fits the evidence as well as any other theory. We think that it was a cult site as well as a political site. And we think it quite probably had to do with um, the care of the dying and the dead. And that the, the, the mayor who carries has to do with uh, psychopompic um, rights that were going on there. And the Brigger comes from the whole of the north of England, from, from east to west is in the land of the tribe that was the Brigantes, which means the high or the exalted. Um, there is, on Hadrian's Wall, there is a um, shrine to uh, Brigantia, the goddess Brigantia. Now, we don't know how far she was connected with Bridget or Breed or any of the other Brig-named goddesses, but a good case can be made for it, let's put it that way. So she she would be the local deity. So we've sort of taken the, the name and the inspiration from the seed group from those things that are going on around us. And we also quite liked the fact that the, the Mandua, uh, it's not just a female horse, it's a particular type of pony that was quite common around here that was known for being very um, strong-headed and having a very strong personality. So we also quite like the fact that you can translate Mandua Brigger either as uh, the high or the exalted mare or the high horses. We quite like being the high horses. Getting up on your high horse. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, wow. so that's that's very close. And also very close, we have Thornborough Henge, which is a triple henge earthwork. There's no stone circle there, but huge triple um, earthwork. Um, again, seems to be laid out, as a lot of these places are, seems to be laid out mirroring the stars in Orion's belt. So there's some hugely interesting sort of archaeological ancient sites around here. And wow. we're, we're finding out more and more about uh, Darlington itself. Um, the, first, the first ritual that we did, which was Imolk, was at Rockwell, which is now in a bit of, it is protected land it is sort of nature reserve e but it sort of backs onto housing estates and it's quite run down and it's it, it's not in any way your sort of archetypal holy well um but we're working on it and we've been back there for for two or three rituals and we're, we're building a relationship with a couple of the places around us um so it's it's, it's a lot it's a much more exciting place than it sounds Wow. Well, I'm certainly I'm fascinated. Just to come back to that Queen Cartimandua, and then just I was just thinking of you know a lot of comments about the passing of of Queen Elizabeth. How does that? How is that for you? Um, I mean, I know the weekend we were in Glastonbury, there were also celebrations for uh, the Queen's Jubilee, yeah. and there were lots of parades, etc. And given I don't live in England, what's the mood like in in in, in the UK now? Uh, quite shocked, I think. I think perhaps because she had been there for so long, I think very few people, certainly very few people that I know would remember a time before she was the Queen mm -hmm. with any clarity. So she's, she's you know, sort of always been there. So there's, there's, a, there's a very real sense of unreality, you know, that it can't quite be happening. Um, sadness. Mm -hmm. And I a lot of people, regardless of, of, of their opinions about the monarchy as an institution, mm. regardless of that, a lot of people are very aware that she was very dignified, that she was very committed to whatever she saw as her duty and that she sacrificed a great deal of freedom and personal happiness. Mm. And there's a lot of gratitude and there's a lot of, a lot of sadness. I can well imagine, yes. I mean, she was what? The longest serving monarch in Britain? Longest serving monarch in Britain ever. 
and I believe this the second longest ever serving monarch. I don't know who the first was. Uh, I I just heard that on a couple of news broadcasts, but um, yeah, that's a Over long time. Years, yeah. I think. Yeah, because I mean, it was two days ago she welcomed Liz Truss, and then suddenly. Um, I think this is why everybody's so so exactly. sort of shocked yeah. because you know. It, there hasn't been any long illness. This is this has happened very very quickly today, really. Yeah, I'm just the comments, you know, stunned and saddened, and um, you know, people expressing sharing grief for for our viewers in the UK, and just to acknowledge that. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay. So <laughs> it's interesting when uh, th that stunness, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm just stuck now. Um, Talov says, definitely feel a, a loss and shed a tear for the loss. Not only the queen, but truly beautiful and caring woman, mother, grandmother, and shining light to the world. Uh, and then Jamie says, today's my mother's birthday. She passed a long time ago. She was born in England. This is a strange day for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Louis the 14th of France remains the longest remaining... Uh with a two year, 72 year and 110 day reign. Oh, wow, so Queen Elizabeth was 70 years. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, just a lot of, uh, just a strange feeling because of the, when somebody's been there for so, so long and yes. um, for many, you know, an important role model. Mm. Um, and now she's gone, and then there's an, you know, it's the end of an era and into um, the next one. So it's, uh, yeah. Anyway, so um, you mentioned Scotch, did you mention Scotch Corner? Scotch Corner, yes. It, it's it basically a roundabout that's been in the same position, give or take 100 yards, for the last 2,000 two years. Uh, it, it, it's the main um, sort of crossroads on the Roman road that takes you from east to west across the Pennines. And yeah. there, there, there was huge, they, they widened the A1 a few years ago and they did a lot of excavation around it as a result. And um, they, they basically found that Roman occupation had been in the area for a couple of hundred years longer than they thought it had as a result of that. So, yeah, that's... Um, the, the, the Roman British interface is quite prevalent around here. As Cartamandua's husband was involved in a rebellion against the Romans, whereas she um, she negotiated with the Romans and kept, again, controversial, but she did keep her people safe and prosperous and wealthy for quite a long time. So, yeah. And one of the... One of, one of the uh, the, the finds that come out of Stanick are some of the richest that you find in, in Fort, certainly in the north. Um, and one in particular, there's um, a, a horse's head, a bronze horse's head that was excavated there. Uh, it's in the British Museum. It's called the Stanick Horse. And um, that is a very... I mean, it, it's one of the reasons we're, we're, we're quite certain, that and the name, we're, we're quite certain that horses were a powerful totem um, around that area. But, um, yeah, that's a very well-known figure. And that, as I said, is in the British Museum. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit about you, your background. I'm interested in your name. Uh, Uzel, where does that where, where where does that come from? Well, we're not entirely certain. Uh, we think it's French. Okay. Um, people have in the past assumed that it's German. They've assumed that it's Turkish, uh, because it's obviously close enough to names in both of those two languages. We think it's French. Um, we think it's related to the French "waso," that means bird. Okay. Uh, we think it's an occupational name, so something like a hawker or a falconer or something like that. Okay. Um, and we used to think it was Huguenot, so we thought it had come over from, from France in the, you know, during the Huguenot period. But my mum has done a lot of research into family history. And um, as a result of that, we found a John Azel, 
living in Hampshire in the 1530s, I think. So oh, okay. there were Rosells here before the Huguenots. So now we're not sure when they first came over. But we've been we've been around for quite a while. There's the, most of the Azels in in England, I think, are in ha either Hampshire or Lincolnshire. Oh, okay, wow. Which is where my well, my dad originally was from Hampshire, and grew up in Lincoln. Okay, so um, you, what brought you to Druidry? Oh, now there's a question. <laughs> um, that is a very tricky question. I. I think I was born interested in religion. I can't actually remember not being interested in religion. And by that, I mean all religion, anything I could get my hands on. Mm. I'm a theology. Uh, I think the first thing I remember reading about it was Robert Graves' Greek myths, which I was reading when I was about nine. Ooh, okay. And, um, and so I had all of this going on. Um, my, my parents, my family is not religious at all, but they're very good at having big conversations, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. we, that sort of conversation was always open to me. And my mum and dad actually met in Singapore when my mum was teaching for the army in Singapore. So, um, again, she'd had experience of different religions and was interested and brought that back. And we talked about it when I was growing up. And I went to a small private school that was very very Christian mm -hmm. and um, as a result I went through a period of very evangelical Christianity and I would say looking back probably quite toxic evangelical Christianity um, and as a result of that I spent a lot of time and energy trying to be the right sort of Christian and the right sort of Christian in this context involved believing the world was created in six days. And I, I really did struggle with that. I struggled with that quite a lot. And because I, I sort of have a natural interest in linguistics and history, and what I was really interested in was the Bible, because the Bible was absolutely, utterly fascinating. And therefore, and I did um, A-level RE, which was effectively biblical studies. And as a result of that, I knew that there were some pretty big contradictions in the Bible, which are not a problem if you believe that the Bible is a document that was written by people who were having experiences of something beyond themselves. It is a problem if you believe that some sort of divine being dictated it word for word, um, which is where I was being told I ought to be. So I, I struggled with that. And in an attempt to get, get my faith back, I did a theology degree at university, oh, okay. biblical studies. Um, so, so now I had contradictions to deal with in Hebrew and Greek as well as in English. Um, <laughs> did you learn both languages? Pardon? Did you learn both languages, Hebrew and Greek? Yes. Ooh. They, they, <laughs> I was at Durham and at that point they were, they were both compulsory. Well, no, I tell a lie. Greek was compulsory. And then you could, depending on what you were specializing in, you could study Hebrew, Latin or German. Um, so I was doing biblical studies, so it was Hebrew. Um, and that led to a very long period of me struggling, trying to get that sort of faith back, failing, negotiating with what I thought my spirituality was and ending up as a really very discontented atheist. Um, I really did not want to be an atheist, but that's where everything was bringing me around. And then I sort of saw some things on TV. I met some people and I started getting interested in, in paganism as a concept. And mm -hmm. uh, the friend that I mentioned earlier, Liz, who was a Druid way, way, way before I was, we got into some conversations and she introduced me to some people. And it wasn't a case of, oh, this is what I believe, because I don't actually think that's how Druidry works. Um it was a case of, ah, oh, these are some people that are having the conversations that I want to be having. Okay. And they are playing with the ideas that I want to be playing with. And the way that they are living out, I struggle with the word spirituality. I prefer the word religion. I know that's controversial. Um, the way that they are living out their spirituality is a way that I can deeply respect and that makes 
a lot of sense to me. So that was kind of the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think, you know, following loads of those conversations and there, there wasn't, you know, I, I'm going to say that Darlington is not a very druidry place, druidy place, but I'm actually going to take that back a little bit now because um, we, we set up our, our seed grove in, in January, um, basically with three of us and my partner, who was sort of a, a, a sympathetic addition at the time. He has since joined Obod. Um, and we thought, well, you know, there's limited things we can do with three of us, but we'll manage. And I think we're now up to 11. So it's, it's more of a druidy paid place than we thought it was in actual fact. Um, but, you know, as a result of those sort of conversations and, um, eventually I sort of took the plunge and, and started the Bardic Raid with Obod, which would be probably an embarrassingly long time ago, actually. Um, probably around 2004-ish, maybe. Took me a long time to do the, the Bardic. I'm, I'm towards the end of the Ovate now, but I've sort of parked it until, because I, 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 I've got too many different things going on at once. Mm. So what I need to do now is finish my doctorate. Once that's done, I'm coming back. I'm picking it up again, but I'm sort of towards the end of Ovate at the moment so yeah it, it was a natural progression really and it as I said it wasn't you know these these are the right beliefs it was these are the people whose attitude towards the world mm -hmm. and scholarship and other people and the other things that we share the world with and service and all of those things just seemed to work for me and over the last three or four years, interestingly, I found that I'm not heading back towards Christianity, definitely not, but I found an openness and a sympathy towards Christianity that I'd lost, and it's quite nice to get that back and to be in, in dialogue with, um, with Christians in a way that's open-hearted and constructive and useful and that that actually feels very good and that must be very healing because when you you describe you know the, the background is toxic and to be able to in to revisit and funny i i was brought up roman catholic and 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 left and uh Drudry's has helped me to be more sympathetic not obviously to the the politics and yeah. the management the, the 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 bureaucracy but um, around the Christian message, the one that's actually <laughs> the real one. Yes, yes. <laughs> and how hard it is to really practice it. But And that's what's um, just so lovely within the order that uh, we, you know, uh, we have Christian members and non-Christian members. And it's around being able to, I think, heal the wounds of wherever we've come from. Yes. And I think Druja can allow us if we open ourselves to it so that then we can take another look. And okay, yes. you don't need to become a Christian, but then you can still have some engagement and understanding. Pat says, yes, it is lovely when you wake up and realize the wounds from the Christian experience of our youth have healed and we can look at it with an open mind. Pat, I didn't read that. You're just reading my mind. Believers of all sorts <laughs> of common ground. I mean, there's a number of people, you know, that's a wonderful accomplishment. Um people commenting in it, Philip, I really understand this. And I think that's beautiful um, to be able, because then you've come around, instead of um, being reactionary and reactive against whatever it is you've come from, that you can move into a new place, that you can look back, and I suppose look back with compassion. Yes, yes, absolutely. And and see value, again, in in my understanding of Christianity, at least, yeah. Right. Michael says, this is what I love about polytheism. I left Christianity a long time ago, but being able to come back around and relate to the Christian pantheon is like closing a wound. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's a next question. And this is from David Hallett. I saw, I don't get to read everyone's comments because they come up so quickly. So um, if people have asked questions and I haven't mentioning it so um i'm not ignoring you it's just that i haven't seen it and i knew david had mentioned something about your, your dissertation and he's asking again for me to ask you about but we'll do that we'll hold that we'll come back to that 
just Alan says, I love that Obad isn't a church with dogmatic policies and beliefs. And of course it isn't. And having come from, um, uh, well, I suppose both of us from dogmatic Christian backgrounds, it's just lovely to be able to come into a place where there isn't. And it's yeah. just that openness. And then Pat mentions um, John Moriarty, of course, a great Christian mystic, had such a lot to offer pagans. It's just really interesting when you said that, that if you, when you read the Bible and you're reading the, the mystical, uh, if you read what they say or what is written as expressions or descriptions of mystical experiences, you can get it. It's when it becomes literal. Yes, and it's, then you have the issue, and of course, as druids, we, we can really understand the magic of mystical experiences. Um, yes, and I think there's, there's this this huge moment of understanding when you realise that a lot of the things in the Bible, the people that wrote those things, never meant them to be taken as historical, literal truth, and would be really quite nonplussed if they could see some of the arguments going on around them now. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Uh, Jamie says, yes, that seems to be one of Druidry's great and profound attributes, that of a healing path, which is lovely. Yeah. So maybe um, I'll ask you about your, if you wish to speak about it now, because you were doing some, okay, just to get back, we put that in the hole for a minute. You were a religion teacher as well. I was. I was um, head of religious education for... I've actually lost track of how many years. Um, taught, again, mostly in rural schools, oddly enough. I started off teaching in Debenham in Suffolk. Oh, um, and then I did a, a year in Redcar and quite a lot of supply teaching and ended up in Teesdale, which is uh, the schools in Barnard Castle. So, again, sort of in the, the foothills around here. And were you teaching a comparative religion or was it Christianity or were you, was it the whole whole? Uh, ah, uh, you, you've got me on one of my uh, my bandstands here. Okay. Um, <laughs> religious education, friend or foe. Um, when it's taught properly by somebody who A, knows what they're talking about and B, believes in its value, I, I believe very strongly that religious education is just hugely, hugely important. Mm -hmm. uh, since um, the 1980 eight i think education reform bill religion there has had to be inclusion of different religions certainly in england and wales uh -huh. um, by law there has to be unless it's a faith school but to be honest most most faith schools do do it as well um so with a, an emphasis on christianity um but also including ninian smarts six main world religions which is unfortunate because that's an outda an outdated model because there are a lot more than six religions and not all of them are world religions but it was a step in the right direction so um comparative religion suggests sort of phenomenological and you know sort of christians do this muslims do this hindus do this yeah. it's more a case of here is a really big question like what does it mean to behave well in the world? Let's look at how some different religions approach that question. Lovely. So that, that sort of that was the sort of approach that that we took, and that RE when it's done well still does take. Um, so so one of my big messages. I'm also I've done quite a lot of work with the Religious Education Council of England and Wales. So I've been. Um, a while ago, they had a project called Resilience, which was sort of parachuting people into the schools to help them teach controversial subjects in RE and not sort of back away from teaching the controversial stuff. And I was one of the appointed reps for that. Um, a few years ago, they were looking at a um, suggested syllabus, and I was on one of the task groups for that, looking at exam work because I'm involved in the examining process for RE. Um, and uh, at the moment I'm an REQM assessor which is religious education um, quality um, award and I sort of go into schools at, well virtually at the moment but I go into schools and sort of assess their applications for that award so um, oh and I'm uh, also currently the Pagan Federation education and youth manager 
So I've sort of got a a a role there that goes both ways. So it's talking to schools about how to approach pagan pupils and how to teach paganism and um, also working with pupils and parents about how to deal with schools and what their rights are and that sort of thing. So that's all been very exciting. But sort of with, within that role, I'm, I'm a huge ambassador for the importance of RE and people's right to de demand good quality RE. When it's taught well, it's, it is one of the most important subjects because, again, critical thinking. There's not many things that teach critical thinking well at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, and there was in 2018, there was a commission that produced a report called the Commission on RE, uh, which has made some suggestions for ways that it could be improved. And I am 110% behind that report. If they did that, RE would just be wonderful. And we would we would lose this trying to divide it into six monumental religions that have these big walls between them. And, you know, that, you know, you are either this and then you have this sort of set of beliefs or you're this and you have this set of beliefs, which is all rubbish. It's not how human beings work. Mm -hmm. uh, and the commission sort of takes account of that. And it's it's a much more fluid and it starts from where the, the pupils are. It starts from, you know, we all stand somewhere. We all have a worldview. What's yours? Where does it come from? And acknowledging that, how do you respond to these other worldviews? So, I have a question from Sky Guy. What is the connection between resilience for children and young people and religion? Okay, so the, the name resilience, I think they chose that because it had RE in it. So it was sort of a, a, punny, a punny clever name. But what, what they wanted was for both teachers and pupils to be resilient in that they could deal with the fact it's, it's very easy to teach the nice things about religion. And it's very easy to um, focus on what all religions have in common. And um, you were just talking about mystical experience. And it's one of the interesting things that the more you get into the mystical writings of each religion, the less difference there is between them, okay. which I've always found fascinating. But RE teachers, and particularly non-specialist RE teachers, which is most of them, it's, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, who is actually a chemistry specialist, but had a spare period, so we've drafted her in to teach RE. And a lot of that goes on. Um, okay. And therefore, they don't feel confident and they're very nervous of approaching more challenging aspects of religion. So, for example, tackling issues like Christianity and homosexuality okay. or tackling issues like um, Islam and Jihad. And it was giving teachers the, the tools, not just in terms of knowledge, but also in terms of pedagogy and um, confidence to be able yeah. to get children to talk about those those issues. Wow. Just a comment from Sean. Uh, literally leading from the front with knowledge and practicality. Incredible ambassador. That's a comment about you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, somebody says, this is Jamie, if I had my way, critical thinking would be taught in every grade and yes. level of education in a manner appropriate to those levels. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, and Anne says, truly listening to young people and their worldviews and values is so important for them and for everyone else. So many parts of education don't do it. Bravo to any groups who have. Um, I know certainly when I was growing up, you know, there was the commandments in the right way and the wrong way. And occasionally we were a bit controversial, but you still couldn't. You could. The idea is that you left the classroom with thinking yeah. right, which is the right. You know, yeah. Rather than thinking for yourself, which is yeah. such a. Yeah. Karen says, knowledge is power. Teaching critical thinking is a valuable protection against indoctrination by cults. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so Philippa says, it sounds wonderful. So different from the RE of my day. I did love the stories, but found them difficult to believe is real. Yes. Yeah. And that, that, that has always been one of our problems because when, certainly when it's about 10 years since I've actually been in the, in the classroom, as it were, but one of the big problems that we had, the, the kids loved it, by and large. Some of the really cool kids made a thing about not like it, or why do we have to do our mm -hmm. And then I met them a couple of years later, and they're like, oh, yeah, we loved it. It was just not cool. 
<laughs> You'd be welcome to admit it. <laughs> yeah. um, that wasn't that was never a huge PR problem for me. Um, the problem was that the other teachers in school and the senior management of the school and a lot of the parents of the kids were about the same age as I was. And that meant that they'd been taught RE the same way that I was. And therefore, they said, well, why are you wasting time and effort teaching this? You know, it's not relevant in the modern world. They need to do something more important. But very often, at open evenings, when I was showing them what we were actually teaching, they're going, oh, right, yes, I get it now. Can I come to some of your lessons? But, um, yeah, yeah. and, and this, this, this is the PR problem that we have to win because people sort of in their, in their late 40s, 50s and older, their experience of RE was the same that mine was which yes. was totally different. Yeah. Well, Ferdiat, who's, uh, he's a teacher. He twice he ended up teaching a GCSE RE class because he was one of those spare teachers with spare classes. Yes. yes. But I imagine, Ferdiat, you did a great job. I have no doubt about it. Um, yes. And then Alan says, critical thinking and developing a value for dialogue. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Alan. Could help prevent further polarization in the world. We need kids who can think for themselves not just join the side. And I think that's a really important one. And I think, you know, um, with all the stuff on, I suppose, in more recent years with social media, that it's very, very hard to express your own thoughts that you ha you're either on one side or not. Oh, or yes. you're pushed to one side or, an, or another, even if you're not. Yeah. And I think, you know, going beyond just critical thinking, I think it's nuanced thinking as well. Yeah. And the ability to understand that if, if you think there is a simple answer to a question, you probably haven't understood the question. That's right, yes. Yeah, there's, there, there's always multiple la layers of meaning and there's always multiple ways of looking at something. And to be able to give kids a real appreciation of that, that's something that they is really going to, to benefit them when they when they leave school and go into the world. That's right. A Sky Guy says, I think I got more resilience from my biology and English teachers than from RE, but so much depends on the teacher. I think it does depend on the teacher and, and also the approach to RE. And when you talk about this new approach, then I can see how that really, really uh, benefits um, young people and more of it. I wasn't aware of that approach. I knew, well, and that's in England. I mean, so many of our schools here are, well, all our primary schools are state schools, but yeah. um, with a Catholic ethos. And then there will be a few Church of Ireland schools. And then obviously it's changed now with, with, with the, um, uh, small numbers, to say, of Islamic schools and maybe Jewish schools. Uh, and then you have Educate Together, which is non-denominational. So, um, but uh, my daughter, she did extra Irish in her school because she didn't have Irish. She went to a Gael school, uh, an Irish language school. So while half her class were in religion, she was doing an extra Irish class. So she's never had any of that. So. <laughs> but um, so that's a really, uh, so I have no idea what goes on in, in, in at second level. Uh Stephanie says, and she's in the US, in America, one political party is moving backwards and trying to remove critical thinking from children's schooling. It's nonsensical. Absolutely. It, it's, it's, um, and I hope that their parents can maybe, if it's in school, undo it when they got home. Sean has a question. Have you any advice to parents of very young kids on how to instill critical thinking and appreciation of cultures and other spiritual ways without tainting their development with my own thoughts and my own ways? just talk to them and I I know that I remember very much from my own parents that if I made anything that sounded like a dogmatic statement on anything be it religion or politics or what I wanted for dinner it was always challenged regardless of of what their their own opinions were you know wow. I, 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 if if I made sort of any kind of definitive statement as as long as far back as I can remember, the response was, "Why do you think that? Why have you said that? Have you thought about this? Do you think this might be another way of looking at it?" And and not to contradict me, but to make me talk about it and to make me think about it and to make me explore the reasons that I had. And the other thing I would say is is expose them to as much as you possibly can. If there are festivals going on in your area, take them, show them the different cultures, the different religions. Um, a lot of places are, are, are more than happy to 
to have visitors to show people around, just expose them in terms of food, in terms of music and dance and religion and everything. Just expose them to as much as you possibly can. I know uh, my family, I mean, and I think that's really, really important. My son would ask me, um, is there a God? Or, and I would say, well, this is what I believe. Now, your grandma believes something else. Mm-hmm. And, this, and other people, so, and he was able to, he had that. He wasn't looking for certainty, but that, in, in, um, ah, so there's different ways of looking at it rather than one. And um, and I think that's really, really important. And also when, if we were going away, Howard and I, and we were leaving them with my sister who would always take them to church or other friends, and they say, do you mind? I said, absolutely, when they're in your place, mm. what you do. Yeah. So if you're going to church, and so they, they had access to church. They didn't like it, but um, they went to it and, they were, and there was no way, I would never ever say, you can't let my child go there. I mean, it's, it's about being exposed to... Um, different systems and making up their own way. Anyway, uh, Sean says, that's fantastic advice. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael says, I was a teacher for a bit. We would ask children for their theories and the thinking behind their ideas. Then we'd ask questions to help poke holes in their theories without giving the answer. It's great. Yeah. And celebrating the positive and all faiths tradition could be wonderful for children. Absolutely. But I, I, I and, and I think that's that's lovely. And but I'm I'm really intrigued about you tackling the the difficult ones, mm. you know, yeah. like Christianity and homosexuality or jihad and Islam, and what all the other uh, abortion, all those really really prickly that are really really important that have to be looked at. Yeah. But that takes a lot of confidence of yourself. And I can see a teacher who's been handed a few spare hours who. Want to- <laughs> stick to the curriculum but I, I'm not used to any of this or I haven't thought about it myself that can be really really challenging yes yes it can and and this was what we, we were trying to sort of put some some support in place for that and um and basically teach try and get teachers not to be frightened of debate and oh. the fact that if if children disagreed with them or with each other that's not a bad thing. In fact, that's a very, very good thing, as long as you can foster that tolerant, respectful disagreement. I said, it's not all about singing from the one hymn sheet or singing in, in unison, you know, that, uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, Alan says, as a parent teacher, critical thinking should also give the freedom and confidence to challenge not yeah. only me in the role of parent or teacher, being challenged also challenges my assumptions. I think that's really, really important yeah. when you have somebody, because often we have givens, and then yeah. when somebody asks us, and I think it's really he- healthy to be able to, uh, oh, pulled up short about something or an assumption that you have. Yeah. Yeah. And to admit when you don't know. I think that the greatest thing a teacher can do is if when somebody asks you a question and you don't know the answer, admit that you don't know the answer. Right. Don't try and make it up. <laughs> And, you know, I kept, when I, when that happened to me, uh, my default position was, actually, I don't know. I will go away tonight and try and find out. How about you will go away tonight and try and find out, and then we'll talk about it next time. Great. And then I remember the first lecturer I'd come across who, that was the, I don't know. I thought, oh, well done, you know, because yeah. um, I had been advised at one point I was going overseas and I was told never, ever say you don't know. And I knew nothing. And there's nothing bad as trying to hide your ignorance when it's, when it's like flashing like a beacon. Yeah. <laughs> you can just say, I don't know. I think it's it's so easy. I mean, it's, it's, it's a relief to be able to say it. Yeah. And Tracy says, I'm a monotheist and new to Druidry. I wish Druidry had been part of my life when I was raising my daughter. Uh, I, that I can understand, Tracy. And um, it's never too late because, you know, if you have come to Druidry as an adult then your daughter too can come to something of her own it's never too late you know that uh f- for people to discover um a different worldview you, you um okay Anne says the irony is that so many educational institutions are based in the way they're set up on old ideas of obedience and hierarchy it's always a challenge to try to encourage freedom of thought in those circumstances I think so yes. uh, 
But we're also living in the world now, in an online world, where it can be very, very difficult to share an alternative view. So it takes a lot of courage to be able to think for yourself. And it's not even authority that you may be challenging, but your peers yeah. and yeah. To, be able to have an alternative view. Uh, I think it's easy face to face, but I think on social media, it's much, much harder. Yes, I think I'd agree with that. And also what we have now that is a completely new phenomenon is the social bubble that very often the only people whose views you see are people that agree with you to some extent or another. And again, that that doesn't help in terms of constructive, useful debate. Uh, you yeah. just it, it, it tends to tends to turn into mud flinging very quickly and very easily. That's right. Yeah. Um, Lynn says just a word of caution. Uh, I believe it's all in the delivery. I agree with you. My father tried to teach me critical thinking by challenging everything I said, which just made me eventually stop talking to him. I remember I, that sounds familiar. It yeah. felt very attacking to me and like I had to defend myself in every statement. I won't work like that. If And yes, it is about. Um, yeah. It's very much in how it's done. Um, it got annoying sometimes, I won't lie. But um, it it was never. It was never confrontational. It was always, oh, and why do you say that? What makes yeah. you think that? Rather than, why do you say that? If that makes sense. Yeah. It was it, it was a genuine question. Why do you say that? Okay, well, let's talk about that. It, it, it wasn't this sort of, I suppose, the adult equivalent of the child that says why to everything. It, it wasn't like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So, um, uh, yeah, to, to, yes, just something earlier you said that you are more um, comfortable with the word religion than you are with spirituality. So, um, just... <laughs> Because most people say, no, no, uh, you know, yeah. the word religion is a really, really, is a tr you know. Uh, yes, uh, I, I can say at this point with some confidence that round about 85% of Druids reject the word religion or religious mm -hmm. because I asked on a, uh, yeah. a Facebook group. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think the problem is with all of these words, religion is one of a, a number of words where we all think we know what it means. Yes, but we're not necessarily actually talking about the same thing when we say it. Yeah. Um, and I think religion is an absolute key part of that. And I know that there is a, a huge trend at the moment that goes towards, you know, I'm spiritual, but not religious. This is mm -hmm. a, a huge thing and a huge movement. And the reason that makes the thing that makes me uncomfortable with the word spiritual is a, it feels very wishy-washy to me. What does it actually mean? And B, the fact that it has it has the word spirit in it, which implies dualistic belief, which is something that I struggle with personally. So um, this I this idea, for example, this idea that in its in its present form goes back to Descartes that a human being is made up of a body and a soul that are united in one place. And when you die, the soul leaves the body and goes somewhere else. Mm. I really struggle with that. And that has made me, certainly with a lot of the, the OBOD courses and exercises, that has made me have to really think about them. So what do I think I'm doing and what is the value of that to me? And my, 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 this is why I don't like the word belief either, because if you want to talk about beliefs, mind change on an almost weekly basis. Um, but that's what makes me uncomfortable with the word spiritual, because it in, implies as a fundamental standing point that there is matter and that there is spirit and that they are two inherently different things. Um, and and so, you, they, so just to come back to that, so for you, they're not two inherently different things. So, so for me, at the end of a, a great deal of, of thinking and banging my head against walls that has gone on since I was at least five in some sense or another, um, my current position, I think, is panpsychism in that 
obviously I don't reject everything that is usually labeled as spiritual or I probably wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. um, but my, to me, the universe makes a lot more sense if you assume that whatever it is made out of on its most basic level is conscious in some way. And if you start so, to assume that matter, matter is to, also is conscious, is what you're saying. Is also conscious. And if you if you start to look at things like that, it's it it, it kind of sort of shuffles into animism. Uh, but these are all terms that have huge areas of overlap anyway. Um, and that allows me to work with the idea of gods, goddesses, spirits, ancestors in a way that's meaningful and doesn't have to have this spirit is some other thing we don't quite know what it is so that's that's my personal issue with with spiritual but obviously you know a lot of people are dualists and that's fine well, this, but, just, this is gabriella she's arguing with you to be spirit doesn't imply dualism it implies spirit is in everything and one chooses to see and acknowledge that personal religion makes me feel uncomfortable that's okay, to her. So, the, so this is getting back to the word religion and, and why it makes you feel uncomfortable. I've got no problem at all with people that use the word spiritual. This is not an attack or a, 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 a argument to get rid of the word spiritual. It just it I think it's a really well. interesting conversation we're having. <laughs> it doesn't sit well with, with me personally. And religion does. And the the way the reason that religion does, that the problem that we have is that a lot of us are working on definitions of religion that were put in place by anthropologists at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And all of those people were working on the assumption that religion looks like Christianity. Because even if they were atheists, they had grown up in a society that was intrinsically Christian in its assumptions. Mm -hmm. So religion to them is something that looks a bit like Christianity. And it's something that is deeply connected with belief uh, and rationality and reason. And these are the fundamental things that define religion. So Edwin Tyler, for example, um, religion is belief in gods or supernatural beings as his starting point. And there are various other um, definitions of religion that have that. And for a lot of Druids, and again, I know this because I asked them, the problem with religion is that it is connected with ideas of dogma and rules and how you ought to behave. And... There are a lot of modern scholars in the study of religion that are working with definitions of religion that fit religion as you find it if you start looking outside of post-Enlightenment Western Protestant Christianity, which has kind of shaped the whole of how academia looks at religion. This is where we get our world religion paradigm from because... Um, because these people looked at religions and said, okay, which ones look a bit like Christianity because they're obviously the world religions and which ones look nothing like Christianity and they're something else. They're not quite religion. We're not sure what they are, but we'll put them over there. And there's, so the, the names that immediately spring to mind for me are Graham Harvey, uh, Douglas Ezzy, who is an Australian scholar, Mallory Nye, who wrote an amazing paper, who said that the problem we've got is we use religion as a noun and we should be using it as a, rever as a verb. People religion. Oh, go and, on. Um, <laughs> and I think this is just a brilliant idea. I really do. And um, what all of these scholars are saying to some extent or another is that I think I'm going to try and remember a quote from Ezzy. This is a book called Sex, Death and Witchcraft which is a lot less exciting than it sounds. Oh, okay. Um, but it's, but it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful treatise on religion and how people actually do religion. And he said that religion to him is a set of um, metaphorical tools that enable a person to live a life endowed with soul. And by soul, he means a life with meaning and connection. And to him, the three things that quantify that are community, ritual, and stories. And they are the three basic elements that define what religion is. And if you take that as your starting point, you can see why I see Druidry as religion, not a religion, and there is a big difference, but I see it as religion because it is people that are interacting with community, ritual, and story in order to make life meaningful. And in in the way that I look at religion, that's what religion is. And people, and so, you know, you are religioning 
when you do some of these things. There's, 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 a, there's other ways of putting it, but it also means that therefore, if you are a Druid, you can't possibly go to a heathen event because that's not Druid. Or because you're a Christian, you couldn't possibly go to a synagogue because that's not Christian, because actually people have fuzzy boundaries. Everybody has fuzzy boundaries and you have things that are coming into you from everywhere. One of the examples, I think, is Harvey that says um, in in a lot of um, African communities, if you look on the books, the population is 40 percent Christian, 50 percent Islam and 10 percent indigenous. And if you look at what people actually do, it's 40 percent Islam, 60 percent Christianity and 100 percent indigenous because those hard boundaries are just not there. And th this is it. And I, I, I know this is controversial and I know that there are people that will re reject it, but on the way that I am defining religion, druidry is religion, but it's not a religion. I'm, 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 I'm really intrigued with this. Uh, Gabriella, I wasn't suggesting you were arguing as in being um, difficult. Uh, I, it is a contrib argument is a contribution to the conversation. She says, I like Dylan Warren, who's an Irish uh, comedian, who says in his show, true religions make you feel guilt and shame. And I think that's how many, many people. Yes, uh, that's where the problem with the word comes from. Yeah. With the word. So what you're doing is, and then Philippa says, just based on your description now of religion, I would say that's what I see spirituality as. Mm -hmm. So for so I, uh, what I think you're doing is reclaiming the word religion yeah. and verbalizing it as opposed to now yeah. that as a and, noun. and perhaps more important because you, you might say you know why does it matter whether we were use the word yeah. spiritual and religion and for, for individual people it probably doesn't matter that much but religion is a word that's used by governments and it's a word that's used by institutions and that's why it's important because we need a system where the only thing acknowledged as religion is not something that you can fit into a book, box that looks a bit like Christianity because it has its holy book and it has its whatever the name of God is and it has its place of worship. If that's the only thing that the media and the government and the people in charge of education see, see religion as being, then we have a problem. And this is the sort of thing, I mean, I have a, a very good friend um, who was studying um, the way that music's used in funerals in um, an indigenous people in Sulawesi for his doctorate. And he got very, very angry because the government would only allow religions to be acknowledged if they had a holy book and a place of worship and a God. And so um, Christianity was fine, Hinduism was fine, Islam was fine, and the indigenous people were in deep trouble and to me this is why it matters that we can use the word religion more widely than perhaps we're used to doing now that is that is really really fascinating um i'm a pagan solemnizer for weddings and uh through pagan federation ireland and um that's under the umbrella so you've got civil marriages in ireland and then you have religious so there's one big 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 umbrella including the humanists are under that umbrella, I think. And it was just easy, just that's where you are. Yeah. And again, paganism is too broad to say it's a religion because, well, which kind of pagan? Because, yeah. um, but I, I think I, 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 I now appreciate what you're saying and the importance of having that to broaden that um, rather than rejecting it as a word to broaden it, and I like the idea. What did you say? Community, relig um, ritual, Community, and ritual and stories, basically. That sounds very <laughs> like what druids do. Sean <laughs> says, <laughs> that's what I love about Obod. It almost goes back to separating belief and spirituality from organized religion, but still offers a supporting community. Makes it more about the personal connection than the organization. Here's the shared experience, but your personal experience is your own. Um, yeah, and I think that's the, the the other really important thing is that we've got this idea again coming out of post-Enlightenment Protestant Christianity that religion's about what you believe. And for most people in most parts of the world, in most periods of history, it's not about what you believe. It's not about the acceptance or rejection of a proposition. Because, you know, there's a wonderful line in one of Terry Pratchett's books. I forget which one it is, but I'm sure loads of people will tell us um, where 
I think it's Granny Weatherwax says, no, of course, no, I don't believe in the gods. Well, they exist. Of course they exist, but you don't want to go around believing in them. It just encourages them. <laughs> yeah. For most people, it's that kind of thing. You know, why, why are we having a debate about whether this spirit exists? Because this spirit is in that tree. It's there. You can see it. Um, so all of this philosophical stuff is really very secondary. And it's about the, the ritual is not a symbol that points to something else. It's the experience in itself. And for most people, religion is sensual. It's embodied. It's about sense. It's about um touch it's about sight it's it's something that is deeply internal and felt rather than conjectured and philosophized about and i i think that's that's something that needs reclaiming as well that this is you know a legitimate way to do religion yeah because i'm just there's i'm sorry i can't there's some people really long comments which are really interesting sean says i was taught the religion was a way to control people in order to get them to obey those in authority which is why it's so full of dogma and i suppose at your, this is what we're talking about is trying to get away from that understanding of it uh, and it comes from the latin religare um bind yeah to bind we well, you, you can look at to bind as in to tie up or, or to bind you to something. It's to connect, you know. Connect. So um, uh, bindings are important. You know, you are bound to a loved one or whatever. It doesn't always have to be restrictive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, Michael says it's witches abroad. Is that the, the that Terry? Would, that would sense, yeah. <laughs> so Pat says the ritual is not a symbol that points to something else. It's the experience of self. Thank you. I'm putting that in my wee Drudry notebook. Um, <laughs> well pat there's a um there's a paper pm me and i'll send it to you by um tasia scruton that is about that exact thing it's and it there is actually a part of it that is about druidry and it's about embodied embodied knowledge as opposed to rational knowledge oh brilliant lovely um alan says uh, when brennus sacked rome he famously laughed at the temple statues for being gods in human form and we don't even know what the celts really believed prior to romanization um, and then he says, and there's a question, Alan, another Alan, different Alan. Is there not sometimes a, a conflict between doctrine and religion? I guess that depends on how you're going to define religion. Um, there is always going to be conflict between doctrine and experience, religious mm -hmm. experience or felt experience. And that's why religions change. Um, no religion mm -hmm including Christianity, has stayed the same for, you know, thousands of years. They don't, they change. Um, and in part, that's because people's experiences change and people's reactions to the society around them, which is also changing, change. And one of the things that has caused so many problems, I suppose, with religion is the fact that the doctrines don't change as quickly. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Um Deborah says, my understanding is that nature's sacred geometry was used to bring indigenous people into buildings by installing it within the churches and then overtaking it so that these buildings were the only places the sacred could be found. That's just one element, of course. Using the mystical, magical awe of nature, I only ever felt that in nature and never at a ceremony until I was so blessed to be at the Healing Bridges with you. Oh, Deborah, <laughs> uh, she was at a Healing Bridges um, uh, festival just two weeks ago. We had a ceremony uh, well, there was one out in nature and then one in the woods as well with a fire. Okay, that's, um, you'd never felt, only ever felt that great. Uh, lovely. Oh, she, the first time she'd felt something like that at a ceremony. That's great. Thank you for the feedback. I have, um, I have to say when I was growing up, um, one of the things, you know, as, as, as well as all the mythology that I was reading, uh, I had very strong memories of sort of driving around in the back of the car and, there is a certain time of day, I think it's often called the gleaming. Yeah. Where the land is brighter than the sky, just as it's going dark. And if there was a if there was a group of trees on top of a hill that we were driving past, there was this real emotional, real emotional sort of punch to the stomach that I used to get from that and still do to some extent. And I think, you know, in terms of what led you to Druidry, I think that's in the mix. It's definitely mm -hmm. in the mix. So, yeah, totally get that. 
Wonderful. Um, Matthew, I think we have a hard time separating dog doctrine from dogma. Doctrine is just teaching, so that is present everywhere, religion or not. Dogma is what you're required to believe, usually on pain of excommunication, unfortunately. Um, Gabrielle, if religions change, isn't this proof of them being linked closely to humans and thus a human construct? Clothes change, architecture changes. Yes, and I, I would absolutely say that every religion is a human construct, which does not mean that it doesn't connect to something beyond that, but every religion is constructed by humans. Yes, of course it is. And if we can't do that, what can we do? So we need to be able to do that <laughs> to, to make sense. There have been amazing um, comments. Um, just I'm sorry that I can't get to all of them. Um, that uh, it's really to have um, a great conversation with this because I'm really, really fascinated with the, the, the spiritual. I just like your notion of religion as a verb. And yes. when you talk about stories, ritual and um, community. And I'm, I'm really intrigued with that because I would have said I'm not religious because I'm stuck in that. Having been brought up in a, in a dogmatic um, religious uh, format, then to move away. And and I hadn't considered the duality of because I recognize the consciousness in all things. So if I'm talking about spirituality, um, it, I, I wasn't conscious of that. I mean, I'm aware of the, the the Cartesian divide, but I wasn't aware of that divide within the word spirituality. Or maybe am I just separating the two when I recognize? And I'm still, I think, you know, okay, I die. My body goes and my spirit goes wherever it goes. And we talk about releasing spirits, etc. cetera. Um, but I under, but I, but I imagine it's my consciousness is still there. That's I just happen to occupy a body. Now, I don't know what I'm talking about now. This is where it's <laughs> it's <a tricky> one. <laughs> it is a tricky one. And, and dealing with the whole issue of life after death within that paradigm. I'm still not sure where I'm coming from with that. Again, my, mm -hmm. my opinions change on a regular basis. Um, whether personal individual consciousness survives death i don't know and i don't know for how long if it does but again if i mean i know that i i did a fair bit of research at one point uh on near death experience and um there was a surgeon who was looking into quantum entanglement as a possible mechanism and if you have this animistic, all things are connected, all things are conscious, then that starts to make a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. You're having to posit something completely immaterial that is other. Um, I don't know. That that's that's another one. That's a whole other conversation. But I'm I'm not sure where I stand on that. But I think what I used to say to people is that whilst I'm I'm still not absolutely convinced about life after death, I'm no longer convinced that there isn't life after death, and I'm a lot happier with that. Okay. Um, Pat says, I don't think my individual consciousness will survive. I think it'll merge back into the universal. If anyone saw Deep Space Nine, think Odo rejoining the Great Link, though I may change my mind. And, I mean, I think that, you know, you, you, you talk about your beliefs changing. Mm -hmm. Um I'm not, I'm, I'm fluid. And it's not that I'm not grounded, mm. that I'm kind of running with the hare and hunting with the hound, but it's that none of us knows. And because, again, okay, it comes back, I'm just going to use the word belief because we're not taking it with facts. And for the want of a better word that, or maybe we say it's my understanding at this moment and my understanding will change when uh, I uh, encounter another idea yeah. or a different experience so and which you I think really change your mind in the face of experience or evidence well then that's what becomes dogma that's right and I but I welcome that I find that really really exciting that uh new discoveries and new insights and new awarenesses just make life really really exciting yes, yes. And, but the price for that is uncertainty so if you're if a person who wants certainty and this is where some people really really need it 
and want it and want answers and cling to it. And I think t- cling desperately because certainty doesn't always. Um, and do yeah, so that's what was my downfall because I was trying to do that when I was at school and just as I was leaving school. And it, it caused me some fairly significant mental health problems. I think it's mm-hmm. safe to say at the time. When I was teaching, I had two big posters on either side of the whiteboard by the time I left. It was an interactive whiteboard by the time I left just. Um, and on one side was um, a quote from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which I am a huge fan of. Um and it was Giles, and it said, get books, look stuff up. Um, mm. And the other one was Voltaire, and it was it said something like, whilst, whilst uncertainty is certainly, whilst uncertainty is a, an uncomfortable state to live in, certainty is a ridiculous one. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. That's, that was brilliant. That's beautiful, yes. Uh, yes that's right. And I remember, I don't know who said, made the quote, but I heard it at a conference. It was that um, quantum uh, theory makes certainty doubtful. Yes. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's it, it, I, that, that's what's exciting to have that and to be open um, to newness. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, uncertainty makes needs for more research. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Um, everything is energy. Therefore, consciousness is also energy and energy is indestructible. So where does that idea lead? But energy is not unchangeable. No. <laughs> it, it does change, but it just can't be destroyed. Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay. And then Pat says, since beliefs can change, there's no shame in being wrong. No need to invest the ego in an opinion. Uh, hence, debate is a totally safe space. Well, I don't debate often once winners and losers. Discussion is different, but usually with debate, there's winners and losers. And then I have my issue with that one. But um, Gabriella Luna, you know her. Okay. Yesterday and today, I recalled a conversation with Jennifer that I was blessed to have in Glastonbury earlier this year. How enriching, deep and flowing it was, I found myself hoping that another opportunity would arise as I came away enriched. And here you are. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, feelings and passions. Thank you for enriching us all, expanding our minds and challenging us in a good and healthy way. That's it, Gary. So, your PhD. Yes, the mythical PhD. (laughs) Do I don't think it's actually going to be the slowest ever done, but it's, it's starting to feel like it. it. It comes from having two other jobs. It's, it makes life difficult. Um, yes, it is about uh, contemporary druidry, uh, okay. contemporary British druidry specifically, and death rituals. Um, so covering beliefs about the person it has to include beliefs about the person what is a person beliefs about life after death and practices surrounding death funerals memorialization and uh looking at theories behind that so also looking at rituals around Samhain and things that engage with the idea of death and ancestry So, um, for example one of the main things that I'm looking at is that we have in the in I think only in England at the moment, there might be, and I don't think there's even one in Wales yet, um, a number of barrows Mm. that have been built. I think the first one was in 2014. Um, And they're designed, they've got niches inside that are designed to take human cremated remains. But from the outside, they look like either Neolithic or Bronze Age burial mounds. So part of what I'm looking into is why? What what is going on here? Um, obviously, they appeal to druids and other pagans, but they also mm-hmm. appeal to people that are not particularly religious. They appeal to some Christians. So um, that obviously raises ideas about how the past is imagined, um, how ancestors are imagined, and how people see themselves, and particularly druids, but not, as I say, exclusively, 
how they see themselves relating to these these ideas of connection with the past and um very often a conscious denial of modern institutions and ways of doing things um also obviously looking at natural burial looking at mm -hmm. ideas of um connection with nature and reciprocity um the idea that the body is is that you are given a body um by the goddess or nature or the earth or however you conceive that and that you give it back um yes. so this sort of mouse is is um gift theory sort of comes into that um ideas around bereavement so um the model you'll know that um over the last 50 years or so the model in bereavement has moved from freud's idea of you need to separate from the person that has died in order to be able to move on to the idea of continuing bonds. Mm -hmm. I'm wanting to develop that idea of continuing bonds and see how that, how that fits with some of the Druidic ideas about ancestry and continuing bonds going in both directions, if that makes sense. Um, and, um, so Graham Harvey has written a lot about what he, well, he doesn't call them. It's a term that he took from Halliday, but um, other than other than human persons um, as a way of describing how people inter interact with plants and animals and ancestors and spirits and gods and all of those things. And I am looking at how people, re how people engage with other than living persons. And again, this is not entirely dependent on whether you believe in personal survival of death or not. I was, I was going to say, okay, where does this fit in? Where is this going? Yeah. <laughs> because it is, it is, well, people do. It's an indisputable fact that people have relationships with people that have died. Even if you were to ask this person, and this, is, this comes through the research of, of, of Valentine, if you were to ask that person, they would say they didn't believe in ghosts or they didn't believe in life after death, and yet they continue to talk to their dead mother, dead husband. And so um, these barrows in particular, the way that people are engaging within these barrows, because they allow for a, a way of ritualizing that doesn't take place at, for example, a crematorium. How how the dead then have agency in the lives of the living. And the question of whether they are beings in a sense that we would understand, whether they continue to be persons in the way that we would understand is a moot point. They may, they may not, but it, it, it works either way. So, um, one example would be that uh, in one of the barrows, um, a couple were, were married. I had a, 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 a wedding ceremony in the barrow because they wanted their grandfather to be there. And that's where his cremated remains were. So you, you, you have this idea of the dead starting to have agency, starting to have an impact. And something that is not uncommon in Mediterranean countries, but is virtually unheard of here, which is that particularly around these barrows, because they're relatively new and people know each other. And so what you get is a community of the living building up around them because the people that are purchasing places in them or the people who are um, have relatives there know each other and there are open days and there are these sorts of events. And this community of the living is interacting with the community of the dead who are within the barrow. And some of these barrows are used as performative spaces. So there's music, there's drama, there's these sorts of things going on as well. So these are all the ideas that I'm, I'm playing with and looking at. And obviously um, Druidry, Druidry is a bit of a different case because the history of Druidry as we understand it now in Britain is about 200 years old, which is one up on most types of paganism, where as we understand it now, it's the roots tend to be in the 50s. 
but what that means, but Obod, for example, in its current form, again, has its roots in the 60s with Ross Nichols. And so we're at a stage where some of the people that were there at the beginning are coming to a stage where they are starting to really think quite deeply about mortality and about how they want to do this. So, for example, Obod has, um, uh, has training for funeral celebrants and these sorts of things are starting to come up. Um, and so there's, there's this wider discussion about, okay, so we have this thing called Druidry, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. How do we as Druids want to engage with death and with death ritual and with all of those things? So that's kind of the, the debate that's going on. Um, it's about half written. The research is all done. It's about half written. Has to be submitted by the end of March. See the panic. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. But my, my intention is very much that, I mean, I've had, I did an online survey um, and my partner said to me, well, how many respondents do you need? And I said, well, I'm not hopeful here because almost every PhD that I've ever read that anybody has done where they've used a survey, there is at least a paragraph in the methodology chapter that explains why it's still valid, even though only six people answered the survey. So I'm not hopeful. <laughs> if I got 50, that would be brilliant. I can do statistically meaningful things with 50. 100 would be wonderful. So anyway, I got about 650. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So I've now got the opposite problem, but I've got far more data than I know what to do with. But it also means that I think I'm sitting on the biggest resource in the world at this point about paganism and death beliefs and death practices. Wow. So there is definitely um, a scope for doing some interesting things with that when I finish. But I am I am very aware that I have been harrying people for a good few years now and putting difficult questions on Facebook groups and that sort of thing. And it is very much my intention once this is done to share that back to the communities that it's come from. So there will be a book. Um, there will be sort of talks and dissemination and that sort of thing is the is the idea. Wow. I could um, also, I'm just going to point, uh, get in here with a very quick plug, if I could as well. That there, is a, there is a support group at the moment. There is a group within OBOD that is specifically for people that are doing academic research on Druidry and are Druids. Um, and it's really quite helpful. We have a Zoom meeting once a month and it's, it's really quite helpful. So uh, I think it's been mentioned in um, Touchstone a couple Great. of times. But again, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, if they're in that position and they'd like to join in, just let me know and we'll we'll sort it. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, Philippa talks about like the Mesopotamians who bury their dead family in the cellar of the house the yes. families lived in and they believe yes. they interacted with each other. Um, Absolutely. There's quite a few um, civilizations in, in Jordan as well and in, um, in Shatelhayuk in Turkey. The, the, the dead continued very much to be a part of the family. And it's interesting, um, being brought up as a Roman Catholic, um, it, you know, um, my mother used to say, you know, you, you need to pray for the souls in purgatory to get them out. So these are your own ancestors, but also pray to your dead father or your dead grandmother. They can help you more now on the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of that I grew up with that um, we didn't use the word ancestor, but it, it, that was there. Yeah. And in, and in rural Ireland, you know, there's a, a cemetery Sunday. So there'd be a few times in the year when people would go and everybody, the neighbours at all, everybody would know each other and know who was in the ground. You know, you're talking about that in, the, in these in these barrows now that communities are developing around it. And rural Ireland would very much have that. Yeah, I think have. Lots of places have that. And it's something that certainly in England we've very much lost. And I think that's, I think maybe certainly the people that are showing interest in the barrows, that's one of the things is that they there is a feeling that that has been lost and that that was not a good thing to lose. Okay. Patty, you know, it's interesting. She lives in her family home. My parents are here and in the fields. I've never felt 
once felt the need to visit them in the cemetery. And that I understand. Howard, my husband, is built or buried in the graveyard next door, but he's out in the garden. Hmm. That's where he is. So I, I don't go unless somebody wants to visit the, the grave. Um, but I, that's where he is. He's, he's out in the garden. And uh, that's where I sense him and where I've had experiences out there, but not at the grave. So it's it's an interesting one. Gabriella, for Maori, my understanding is family that passes away becomes helpful or non-helpful ancestors. I found that very practical and useful. I imagine helpful ancestors are the ones who were peaceful when they were here. Yeah. And then in Germany, Alan says, they're burying people along the sides of expressways because of lack of space. And I know I was in... Um, in Vienna with Siggy, who's a member of the order. She was a guest. Oh, I can't remember how long I'm doing this now. And uh, she took me to the cemetery in, in, in Vienna. And there you you buy your plot and you can stay there for 10 years. And um, they were, you can see these X's on the various graves. You know, that's either you haven't paid your rent, then you will be dug up and obviously put into an ossuary of some kind. And I found yeah. that fascinating because here we don't dig up, you know, you're there for a lot. You know, say you're yeah. there for life or you're there for um, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think this this uh, that is very much a part of the culture in a lot of Europe. Um, and it was an interesting discussion that I had. Um, we had um, two PhD students, for one from Belgium and one from the Netherlands that were over for a while. And... Um, in the department and I sort of took them on a, a tour around various places and um, one of the big cultural differences and legal differences actually is that in in England it's almost impossible to dig somebody up once they're buried it becomes very expensive and very difficult and very bureaucratic uh, whereas in the rest of Europe that seems to be very straightforward oh. however what in England you can do pretty much anything you want with cremated remains. And Whereas in Europe, it's very restrictive in a lot of places. And um, we had to, I should mention at this point that I also helped to run a funeral home. We had to send some cremated remains back to Germany on one occasion. And the only legal way to do it was to send them to a funeral director in Germany because the family could not, you know, they could not be moved within Germany unless it was being done by a registered funeral director. Um, and, of course, given that I don't speak German, that got quite exciting once or twice. So, <laughs> but, you know, it, in, there are huge restrictions on what you can do with cremated remains in most of Europe, but you can exhume bodies fairly easily um, to go into an ossuary, whereas in this country you pretty much can't exhume somebody unless there's a crisis but you can do pretty much anything you like with cremated remains. And it's just interesting that there's that, that there's that difference. Pat has a question. Why do English people take so long to bury folk? Uh, Northern Ireland, we do it in about three days. English folks seem to wait weeks, except for Muslim people. I, I think with uh, Muslims and Jews, it's, it's very quickly, but I think that's got to do with climate. Uh, um, yes, I think, um, I think initially that had to do with climate. Um, uh, yeah. There is, a, there is a biblical verse that is often given as um, justification within Judaism. But, of course, that is, it's one of those things that once it becomes dogma. Um, and there, there are most cemeteries will bury Muslims or Jews within 24 hours if they possibly can in England, provided there's no hold up with the coroner or something like that, which is the issue. Um, why the delay? I don't know. Um, it depends. Sometimes, more often than not, the delay is paperwork rather than anything else. Um, sometimes we are asked to delay a funeral because people are having to come from distances mm -hmm. and in the case of getting everybody together. Um, we did once, and it nearly killed me, managed to arrange a funeral within three days because um, the lady that had died, her daughter was visiting from America and had a uh, flight booked to go home and had come to us and said, can you possibly? And we said, we will do our level best 
but it depends on what the doctors are doing because very often the when somebody dies unless it's been uh, the case has been taken on by the coroner two doctors currently one doctor because we're still on covid regulation has to um complete a form that basically says this is this is specifically for cremation to say that they don't believe the death is suspicious that should be a really straightforward process, but it has to be the doctor that was attending the person. Okay. If that doctor happens to have gone on holiday just when the person died, and that has happened to us on more than one occasion, okay. and yes, then you're kind of stuck. So, <laughs> um, so usually that sort of long delay, it's either because there aren't spaces in the crematorium or it's because there's a delay in paperwork, or it's because the family actually have requested it. I would say most of the funerals that we deal with are about a week and a half, I would say, is normal. Ah, which when my aunt, or my husband, late husband's aunt died in, in, in London, we waited a month. It was a month before her cremation, and I assumed that was to get a slot. And it was very quick. I was really struck with, you know, we just as we're going in somebody else is coming out and then takes 20 minutes and then people like these barrows because it takes you away from this conveyor belt and then when my stepson died in in in, in died in derbyshire and he had a wooden burial in scotland we decided it took a week before we even got to see him to see his body um and then we decided we'd wait another two weeks just to give us time to go back to ireland yeah and, and go and I really like that that's not an Irish thing and when Howard died we I, I waited five days that's very unusual but I needed that time as yeah. he was here I waked him here um but mostly it's three days which I find very quick so it, you know it's it's all got to do with um you know what what's what's right for you I, I think the idea of paperwork is a bit delays in paperwork that's hard yes yes it is it's kind of the bane of our lives yeah, to spend an awful lot of our time on the phone to coroners' officers or doctors. Yeah, find out where they've actually sent the form, because we, we we did have a delay once where they were absolutely adamant that they'd sent the form, and it turns out they'd send it to the sent it to the wrong registry office because they assumed that that person the funeral was going to be in a particular county and it wasn't; it was going to be in a different county. You know that sort of thing. Yeah. Julia says, it, down south, it's like trying to book a wedding venue. You're lucky to get a slot within two weeks. Yeah. Okay. There, are, there are a lot of crematoria that, that have that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 um, I don't know what helps. I just know what, what, what I appreciated having that extra time rather than it be rushed. Uh, we do find that a lot of people do. And one of the things, I mean, we, for a long time, we were calling ourselves an alternative funeral home, which always felt wrong to me because nothing that we were doing should be alternative. You know, it's it's not like that every funeral we did was a woodland burial or that we were dressing up as clowns or anything. It was it was that we were being transparent and as honourable as we could be. Um, so, for example, since last September, it has been against the law for a funeral home not to have its prices on its website. Well, we've been doing that for 11 years. So, you know, this this sort of thing. You're, you're putting your, sorry, it, say that again, I repeat it. Okay, so in September, the law changed. The CMA yeah. um, Competition and Markets Authority stepped in with funerals to try and make them a bit fairer. And since then, it's been against the, the law to not put your prices on your website and up until that point nobody did it's like absolutely nobody did we've been doing it since we started okay. 11 years um so this is what we meant by al by alternative but we we um we work with the good funeral guide a lot and some of their funeral directors have recently started using the term progressive which i like much more so we're a progressive funeral home um <laughs> And one of the things that that means is that we will quite possibly have four or five conversations with a family before we even get the paperwork out. Okay. And we can tell, I think our record for conversations about the funeral is 18 hours over three days. Um, 
And what the family wanted to do at the end of that time was quite different to what they thought they wanted to do at the beginning of that time. Yeah. And this is why actually having that time and the time to talk. And we had another family that came in. I think it was the last family that actually physically came into the office before the COVID restrictions. And they spent ages talking about the person that had died. And they came back to us afterwards and said, actually, for us, that was part of the funeral because we got to spend that time talking about them and recreating them. And I think that is one of the occasions when having a little bit of extra time can be a really helpful thing. We had uh, another occasion where um, we had a cardboard coffin and the family, over the course of about a week, the family came in every night. I think the youngest person was about nine and the oldest person was in their 70s. And we have um, we have sort of a front office and then double doors that go into the chapel where the coffin is. Well, on this occasion, the lady wasn't in the coffin. We'd sort of put a stretcher bed together and she was in there. And the doors were open and the coffin was on the coffee table. And the family, they came in about five o'clock and they went home about eight o'clock every night for a week. And we just got tea and coffee and biscuits out. And the family were decorating the coffin. And they were putting pictures and writing poems and all this sort of thing. And they were, as they wanted to, going in and out of the chapel and spending time with um, with the lady's body. And then at the end of the week, um, the lady's daughter came in with us and all the three of us, my partner and I and her together, put the lady into the coffin. And, you know... That was very valuable time for that family. That was time that was a part of, you know, this, again, you know, you're talking about ritual and you're talking about embodied knowledge. And that time is as much a part of the death ritual as the 20-minute service at the crematorium is, perhaps more so. Uh, I know that. Um, we do that at home. I mean, in Ireland, well, it's changing in modern time, but I'm hoping it's coming back, is wakes. Yeah. You know, time around the body, talking, telling stories. That yeah. is really, 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 really important. I mean, uh, we had a about two weeks ago, actually, very recently, we had um, we'd taken a lady home the night before her funeral, which does still happen quite a bit around here. And we'd had this this phone call from the family and they said, there's something we want to do. It's really weird. Um and this, this lady had been quite well known because every time workmen or any kind of sort of service person came to the house, they'd get a cup of tea or coffee and a bacon butty. Okay. And she said, um, the, I think it was the son that actually said, when you come to collect us on the morning of the funeral, we want to give you a bacon butty. Yeah. <laughs> and if you look on, the, uh, on our company's Facebook page, we've got a, a picture up there and We've actually, and this, I want to make it absolutely clear, this was at the family's insistence. We've got cups of tea and coffee and bacon sandwiches on the coffin. And we're actually sort of eating these things off the coffin. And to, to them, that was a hugely important part of the ritual because she got to offer that hospitality. Our last act. That's beautiful. Yeah. That is absolutely lovely. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, lots of uh, comments as well. Um, yeah, there is a value of being able to stay in one place where you have community and hopefully family of some kind. Not everybody has that, but I suppose um, having creating a community wherever you are, if you can. But there's also very important, you know, you're talking about people um, having the delay, then it buys them time to change things. Mm. I think this really, really is important that um, people talk about death and their rituals long, long before it ever happens. Yes, absolutely. That's and, so, so important. So it doesn't come as a shock. Yeah. And we, we, you know, people are always telling me that death is a taboo and people don't talk about it, which is absolutely not my experience. Yeah. If you, if you, if you have an event and you invite people to come to it and talk about death, there'll be tumbleweed. I've, I've seen this so many times. There'll be absolute tumbleweed. If you bump into somebody and you tell them you're a funeral director, then two hours later, they'll still be talking about it nine times out of 10. And we've had the we had the postman come into the office with a parcel 
And he wound up staying there half an hour and telling us all about what he wanted for his funeral. And we we're like, great. What you need to do now is go home and tell your wife everything you've just told us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, these are incredibly. And, and we, we also, um, we have a, a form that we can send to people, which has got the, all these questions, you know, what do you want to happen when you die? Starting, starting with, would you rather die at home? and all the way through to the actual funeral service itself. And we say, right, take this, fill in as much of it as you want, and put it wherever your will is. And then, you know, your, your, your family has some way of, of knowing what you want. And, you know, better still have the conversation with them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Beth says she's told her partner that she wants chips passed around, drinks, and no one is to cry, and I want fun stories. Okay. I know at Howard's funeral, there was lots of stories and a lot of laughter. Uh, was lots of not crying at the ceremony but I think having I suppose having there's always that thing too who's the funeral for is it for the deceased or is it for the the family and when there's a disconnect between the two there yes. can often be a, a challenge absolutely yeah so it's, it's um, this, this has been one of my research questions actually when I've been talking to druids it's like who do you think the funeral is for yeah and then Karen says, highly recommend to run a death cafe. I've run two and they're so valuable. You can Google resources to run them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Totally behind that. Bit tricky for us as funeral directors because it looks like we've got a vested interest, even if we don't. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. They're brilliant. Yeah, and, you know, when it's led by somebody who's not afraid to talk about it, you know, yes. oh, this is really morbid. And I go, no, it isn't morbid. This is what it's about and not to be afraid. I don't remember when I, how old I was and I saw my, saw my first dead body because I was taken to funerals as a child and would see people. Um, now, the first time I saw a dead body was about six weeks after I started working with my partner in a funeral home. I would have well, been, <laughs> which was about 11 years ago. So, what was that like for you? So that was, that was interesting. Uh, he was great because um, the, the, the funeral directing side comes from him. He okay. had he had been a funeral director with a big corporation. And it's it's a long, complex story that involves vast amounts of synchronicity. It's the sort of thing where you look back and you see a story. Yeah. Um, but he um he found himself simultaneously no longer being a full-time carer because he was only working part-time because he was taking care of his mother. And when okay. she died he had a lot more spare time and he'd inherited quite a bit of money. And um, at that point, an opportunity came up for him to buy into an independent funeral home. Oh. So it's, it was it was one of those, oh, my goodness, you know, this is all happening at once. And I have obviously no background. My background's in education. And um, I initially went into it because I'd, I'd quit teaching, which is a, uh, a long, sad story that has a great deal to do with my head teacher at the time. And um, most of what I was doing was examining at that point. Okay. And for that, I needed a phone and a computer. And I thought, well, yes, I can do that at home, but then I'll, I'll never see Keith because he'll be at work all the time. Or I could go in where he has a phone and a computer and effectively be the receptionist and get on with my own stuff. And doing that was where I kind of, to my lasting surprise, discovered I had a bit of a vocation for it. Wow. Um, and I think the, the, the first time, because uh, I have a, a very strange relationship with death. I had a bit of a nervous breakdown when I was 16 and I realized I was going to die. Um, mm -hmm this has been hugely instrumental in shaping my life and the fact that I wound up doing a theology degree rather than a law degree and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, I didn't know how I was going to react and I had never seen a dead body. So I didn't know how I was going to react to that. And Keith was brilliant. He was saying things like, um, can you fetch me so-and-so out of the mortuary? There is somebody in there. You don't have to go in if you don't want to. I'm just leaving it there and letting me, find my own way and my own pace and I think the uh the, the the crux came we'd been round at a lady's house arranging her mother's funeral with her and her name was Jennifer and she was about the same age as me 
and we sort of did a bit of a connect and she'd given us some of her mum's makeup and asked us to make her mum up. And I said to Keith, um, can I do it? Because I probably know a bit more about putting makeup on than you do. And he said, well, if, if, if you're comfortable and you want to, then yes, of course you can. And I think that was, that was a real watershed. That was the time when I thought, this is, this is not just me being somewhere where Keith and a computer and a phone is. This is something that I actively want to do. And making a huge, important contribution. Yeah. That's lovely. Um, it's interesting about seeing bodies. Um, Teresa says, I was 12 years old. My father died unexpectedly. My mother gave me the option not to go, but I went with her to the service. And then Alan says... I remember all too well as a young child not being allowed to attend the funeral of someone I dearly loved. It bothers me still. And I think that is, um, I've come across that so many times and where um, friends of mine whose parents died when they were children or who weren't allowed, who were totally excluded, all, you know, so that they wouldn't be upset. You, yeah. You know, and I think it was to protect the adults from the children's upset and yeah. That leaves a mark because um, I think it's very, very important for us to see the people we love dearly, if that's what we want. And that's the thing, yeah. Regardless of our age. And I know others have been forced, you know, to kiss their grandmother's body or that. And that's traumatic as well. It, it, it's about choice. It's about being being led by what the child themselves yeah. wants to do. That's yeah. Right. Rather than any idea what, what they ought to be doing. Exactly, exactly. Karen says, I feel there's not enough support for those working in the funeral industry. Who holds those who support us? Having spoken to folk working in the profession, they are dedicated and, and caring. So that's an interesting question. Yeah. No, there is nothing consistent. I mean, for Keith and I, we support each other. Yeah. Um, and we're very lucky in that. Um, and I can remember getting quite upset about a situation quite early on in this and Keith saying to me you know can you do this and I said well the way I see it if if I'm going home in tears every night then obviously I can't do this and I need to not do it if I'm never going home in tears then I probably shouldn't be doing this yeah and you know that's that's the thing if you if you build up walls so that it doesn't touch you at all and you stop thinking of the people that you are dealing with whether living or dead as people that's where a lot of the funeral industry has gone wrong yeah. um, but it is very difficult and you do encounter some extremely difficult situations um and as i as i said for keith and i we have each other we have our i'll use the word spirituality uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is very helpful and actually laughing together is probably the best therapy the single most useful thing that you can do but yeah I think some of the big corporations there is there are sort of therapists available to them if they need but you're right there isn't as much as there should be and often it's not the therapist you need it's you have that mutual support yeah. with you it's, it's peer support can often be really really important it's not that you're necessarily traumatized but that you've someone to debrief with yeah. when in a difficult day uh the ordinariness the ordinary support as well as therapeutic yes. support you do need it but the ordinariness and the ordinary conversations around it i think is really really important yeah absolutely oh, oh alan has looked up um there's a 20 to 40% burnout statistic for funeral staff in the US. Wow. And Gabby says, I adore the way you and your husband listen deeply to the family's needs, to the wishes of the person who has passed in the community. Our hearts sing to know human beings are being supported in this way. I had that with our undertaker. He was incredibly came a few weeks before Howard died because Howard was dying at home and he had a bad night and I thought, okay, he's probably going. And he just said, you can have as much of me or as little of me. And he made everything possible. Yes, you can have the funeral in the garden. Yes, we can take the coffin. Yes, you can do this way. Yes, mm -hmm. everything was all the things we could do. And I yeah. really, really appreciated that. And a, a friend died recently. She was a druid. And her sister, I went to the, there was a Christian funeral. And then there was a, um, more of a, a pagan one uh, at the crematorium. 
and uh, her sister was telling me that when she passed, she was still wired up to various things. And the nurse just said to the, the family were all with her and they said, would, would you just like to step up for a while? We're just going to make, get her ready. Just, but the door was open and the sister heard the nurse talk to her by her name hmm. and said, I'm now taking this out and calling her by her name. And she said, you know, they were so moved that this nurse was so respectful of her sister calling her by her name and saying, and this is what I'm talking her through, whatever she was doing, like taking out the IV or whatever it was and making her comfortable. And I thought, wow, they said that was so, so important. And they mightn't have heard it had the door been closed, but luckily they heard her. And that was such a gift to them. That nurse was able to have that, that compassion and caring and love for her work that she could recognize that she had passed. And then there's that thing, you know, when does the spirit leave? And I know from some of the training I've had, you know, that they can still hear you for a few days and all of that, uh, how important that is. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have, we have a thing that if there is somebody in the mortuary, we all, or, or the chapel for that matter, we knock before we enter because we're going into their space. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Which is so unlike a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then Alan says we can expect to see a massive funeral service for the Queen will be expected I imagine it will be uh, um, a really really big one so uh, I mean the last big I don't know what it was for the Duke of Edinburgh but I know when Diana died I mean that was just huge I mean I knew Irish people who flew over to the funeral because um, she had been so popular with so many many people so um, you know what it's um, we have been on almost two hours <laughs> and I know you, uh, you you sing and I'm just wondering how we can <laughs> uh, just change the tone a little bit. Um, I just want to acknowledge Talov. He says, my sister took away my right to say goodbye to my mother, but I still hold her close in my heart every day and see her every time I look in the mirror. And that is lovely to be able to hold on to that, even though something was taken that you still have her close in your heart. And then it comes back to, you know, life after death, is it there or isn't it? And I suppose it's all our own sense and what makes sense to ourselves. So, um, so uh, anyway, lots of positive comments as well about the last two hours. Would you, have you any of your needle felt just to show us? I, I have, I have. Um, this is, I'm not sure what the word is in English. Technically a fetish, I suppose. Um, this is Bridget or Brigantia, lovely on, right there. Yeah, who is needle felted? I'm trying to get the camera right. Needle felted, yeah. and is, is her body felted? Needle felted as well. It's very solid. Body, or is that the body is needle felted? The whole body is needle felted, and her dress. I used to do a lot of historical reenactment when I had more time, and a lot of this was sort of rediscovering craft. So her hanger rock. Pet plus this is woven i wove that myself wow a little loom and it's wool that was dyed with madder ah oh, good <laughs> and uh, her underdress is actually made from cloth that my underdress was made from and oh. then she's got little fimo and the um the brooch is there you probably can't see terribly well but there's little bits of sea glass in the middle oh, the beautiful. That it came from and um bridget's cross did you make the cross? I didn't. I bought the cross. I made pretty much everything else. Um, there's some finger braided for the belt. She has a... Her hair, what's her hair? Her hair is um, tops. These are basically from cuttings off a sheep, fleece. Very good. It's very hair. Oh, the screen, it's very hair-like. And somebody yeah. said to you, wait a second, kudos from a fellow needle felter. That's from Elizabeth. <laughs> and she has, I don't know where it's gone, actually, but ah, there it is. She has a little um, staff that's made of rowan that comes from the tree. Oh, in the beautiful, garden. beautiful, beautiful. And a beautiful. tiny little, and she's got a little cup, which is made of Priscelli Bluestone. So Ooh. she's my altar with all of those things. And her cloak, now it went from ancient crafts, to slightly more modern crafts. Her cloak is, was me teaching myself how to do Tunisian crochet. Um, so she's got a green mantle because it's Bridget. Oh, wow. 
He's got so that's a very tight, that's a very tight uh, weave of crochet, yes? Yeah, it's Tunisian, which is slightly differently done. From So you have one long needle and oh. all the stitches stay on the needle all the time. And then she's got, to try and give the effect of flowers, she's just got some tops that are just... Ah, oh, beautiful. In, and the triple flame for the, the three fires. Okay. Just felt it on with, with the fleece. Okay. And then on the inside, it's, it's lined with silk. Oh, my goodness. It's got, this is sort of um, a homage to Brigantia rather than Bridget, who is uh, okay. a victim goddess. So, as I said, reenactment. Done reenactment for ages. So this is stain dyed with chainmail. So I use my dad's chainmail, and um, basically it's laid on to damp silk with seawater. And because of the brigantes thing, I had Keith collecting seawater for me in Whitby, and my dad collecting seawater in Southport, which is where my mum and dad live. So we had the east coast and the west coast, and the brigantes okay. area sort of. So it's it's all really quite uh, quite. It took me a few years to make. It's all really wow. quite That's very <laughs> impressive. Really is. And she has got a, a cloak uh, brooch somewhere, but that disappeared, and I haven't found it since. It'll turn up when it's ready. She's got a little necklace of garnets as well. Wow! Very very impressive. Wow. <laughs> so, would you like to sing your song? I will do my best. Um, Worth mentioning this way, this it's it's a song by um, a lady that I'm sure a lot of people will know called Talis Kimberly, who um, I am a huge fan of. Okay. And going back to what we were saying right at the beginning about taking inspiration from paganism and Christianity and whatever you find, and this is a song that is very much about that embodied religion. It's not about belief and dogma. It's about finding spirituality, uh, religioning in the little things um, and in the creative things rather than in the big philosophical things. I also say <clears throat> it was written for a voice that is almost 100% unlike mine. So <laughs> there, there will be issues. <laughs> it's called Gentle Saint of Bread and Butter, and I absolutely love this song. And I actually wrote to Talis and I said, I sang this in the I Steadford at... Um, I also belong to a, an online um, grove, the Grove of the Ether. And I, I sang this at our last online meeting in the I Steadford. And I, I wrote to Talis and I said, can I can I use your song? And she, she very kindly sent me all the lyrics. Oh, oh, lovely. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Nanny Jean is stirring porridge. That's a blessing goes both ways. Time to bring the gloves and hats and scarves out. See the skies are pewter grey. The harvest not the best. Last planting time had too much rain. Gentle saint of bread and butter and porridge. Bless the grain. I hold fast to the little things that keep me on my feet. Attuned to learn a cake to ice. A knitted something to complete. This the silent prayer I offer when I feel I cannot cope. Gentle saint of bread and butter and knitting, lend me hope. Gentle saint of bread and butter and of things I can't explain, lend me hope and grace and kindness. Bless the seed and bless the grain. My faith's a kind of patchwork, with it I am well content. I believe that nothing's wasted where goodwill and love are spent. When I'm feeling lost and aimless, on a blue rock drifting nameless, in the vast immensity of space, gentle saint of bread and butter, lend me grace. Gentle saint of bread and butter, and of things I can't explain, lend me hope and grace and kindness, bless the seed, and bless the grain. When I hurt and when I'm angry, when my heart is filled with pain, lend me hope and grace and kindness, bless the seed, 
And bless the grain, bless the knitting and the baking, bless the growing and the making, bless the patchwork and the porridge, bless the ground and bless the grain, bless the hurting and the hoping, bless the crying and the coping, bless the dying and the grieving, bless the sunlight and the rain, gentle saint of bread and butter. Gentle saint of bread and butter, bless the grain. Oh, that's beautiful. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Gabriella has been meaning to say for a while that the, the way the shawl is behind you makes you look like you've angel wings. <laughs> <laughs> this shawl was crocheted by a very good friend of mine. It's my, it's my security blanket. It's beautiful, beautiful. So lovely comments um, uh, about your singing, about your creativity, about the, the, the conversation. So I just want to, oh, we've gone over the two hour mark. <laughs> so I just want to thank you so much. So um, a real blessing for the heart and head. Love this. Thank you both. That's from Pat. Thank you, uh, and thank you for the blessing. A most interesting evening. Thank you from us both. That's from John and Lynn. What a pretty song. Just some lovely, lovely comments. And it's been just a joy. I mean, I could, I feel we've only, we could, we could have gone on and on and on and on. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> lots and lots of things we could have talked about, but it's just been a really wonderful conversation. So I'm going to say goodnight to you, but I'll just send you backstage because then we can, we can look at the, at the comments. Um, I just want to thank our viewers as well for um, the rich comments, the questions. Um, it, you know, our viewers always make the conversation um much richer so i always appreciate that so and again apologies for not getting to everyone every comment but we'll go through them uh, afterwards and um so i'll let you say good night uh jenny okay uh, thank you so much and thank you so much for all the the lovely comments and those questions um as ema says we could we could go all night with those so thank you very much for that and good night okay so thank you all again. As I said, it's just been great to be back um, and to have such a, a lovely uh, conversation and a topic, a very, very interesting topic uh, to start this new season. So uh, it's been lovely. So I look forward to seeing you all um, next week uh, for another Fireside Chat. So enjoy the rest of your evening, morning, afternoon, or wherever you are. And uh, May you all go in peace. Slong a foil until we meet again. <laughs>